Hello folk, how you doing? Scotty. So I was recently requested to do a response on Robert Reich and I've seen some of his arguments before and I'm pretty sure it was in relation to do with the wealth gap and all the rest of this nonsense. First of all, let's have a listen to what Robert Reich has to say on the taxation issue and taxing the rich. Income and wealth are now more concentrated at the top than at any time over the last 80 years. And our unjust tax system is a big reason why. Wealth is not the quantity of paper you hold in wages. It's not the quantity of money you hold in your pocket, in other words. You know, you could argue that that is wealth, but that isn't wealth. Money is merely just an exchange for the things that you get. If that was the case, then of course the Venezuelan people would be stinking filthy rich. They would probably be richer than any country in the world. Unfortunately, that isn't the case because the economic reality is, with all of that paper money that they hold, they can't even buy one toilet paper with it because of hyperinflation. And this is the thing that I argued before and why the printing press is disastrous, why you cannot finance the economy without the private sector. That's what inflation is. Increase in quantity and circulation of the paper that's been printed and the more and more that you print, the greater the inflation is. It's like I said before, folk, and I repeat this again because it's important that folk understand this. It's every one dollar and one pound to the value of the product. For every one dollar and one pound that you print, there's one plus debt added to the currency. You end up facing currency devaluation. The prices of goods and services end up going through the roof. It's not so much that the costs are driving up. It's because of the fact that your currency is devaluing in purchasing power. And that's the only way that you can really finance socialism, so to speak. So that's, you know, his argument. Um, doomed from the get-go. But he's arguing, oh well, we'll just tax the rich, you know, we'll just redistribute their wealth. Well, this is why it's important to understand what wealth is, folk, because wealth isn't the quantity of money you hold in your pocket. It's not the quantity of paper. Yes, of course, these people are wealthier. And I'm not saying that today's system's, you know, perfect or that, because we don't live under capitalism. We live under this corporate system, and there is something unjust about it, where you see the giant corporations holding monopoly power or, you know, the oligopolistic power, etc. And it's all because of the way that things have gone. Wealth is really all down to consumer consumption. So in other words, it's down to the amount that you can buy. So in other words, if you had a stronger purchasing power of your monetary value, you'd be able to buy more with it. Your material wealth has improved in terms of your material standards of living and consumer consumption has actually driven up. It is true to an extent the devaluation of the paper currency has had an effect on society. And this is one of the arguments that I made even when it came to the critics of Margaret Thatcher. They don't understand that when Britain was faced with the heavy nationalisation prior to Margaret Thatcher, well the only way that you're left to try and finance the massive big bloated public sector, the heavy nationalisation, is essentially through that of running the printing press. The rich people are not affected by that. They are not affected by the devaluation of a paper currency because they are not reliant upon it. That's because most of the wealth that the rich hold is held in assets. In other words, it's not an actual paper currency, it's not an actual money, it's held in assets. An asset would be like Jeff Bezos company Amazon, That that's an asset and it's not an actual money. So even if you were to use the argument to redistribute the wealth in terms of meaning their money, they don't have enough because most of their wealth is held in the assets. They really don't understand the laws of supply and demand, think that they can just control people and then think that people are somehow robots that zip up the back and have got a wee button in the back of them to press. They don't comprehend the fact that human beings are self-interested, that human beings are not forced to stick around. Human beings have legs to run with and bags to pack. So in other words, this is exactly what you see throughout recorded history. Why else do you think that in all of these socialist regimes they had to, you know, build stuff like the Iron Curtain or build things like the Berlin Wall to try and keep people in. Well, it's pretty obvious why. Who's going to stick around in East Germany when West Germany's better off? You didn't see people trying to escape over the Berlin Wall for East Germany. That, that just isn't the real world. The very reason why the Berlin Wall existed and why these walls exist is because that's the only way they can try and keep people in. These people don't understand the 
laws of supply and demand. Robert Reich is utterly clueless about the laws of supply and demand because it's just like I said in relation to consumer behavioural pattern, it's the same thing with regards to employers. When the price of something drives up, the demand falls. And when the price falls, demand drives up. They, for some strange reason, seem to think that they can actually argue with that. They honestly do. You know, no different to do with the argument on the minimum wage laws because they've tried that. This is why they're now arguing about taxing the rich. You're saying, oh well, since that's not the case then, let's just, you know, tax the rich. Even with the minimum wage, it's ignoring the laws of supply and demand because the wage of the employee is the price to the employer. If you raise the wage of the employee, you're raising the price to the employer, the, the demand from the employer falls. The socialist doesn't seem to comprehend these rich people are people. They're individuals and they have their own individual self-interest. What are they going to do? Try and control them? All the rich people are going to do is just either, you know, pack their bags and leave and take their business out of the country. How on earth is that going to benefit society? Just imagine this for a second, if all these companies just packed up and left, what would you be left with in terms of wealth? Because after all, all money is really is just an exchange. That's what you use it for, to buy goods, don't you? So if you can't afford anything with all that money you've got, are you wealthy? Of course not. It's just like Venezuela, where they can't even buy one toilet paper. Let's just go on with his argument and have a listen to this. The tax code is rigged for the rich, enabling a handful of wealthy individuals to exert undue influence over our economy and democracy. Conservatives fret about budget deficits. Well then, to pay for what the nation needs, ending poverty, universal health care, infrastructure, reversing climate change, investing in communities, so much more. Okay, the first point there, you're never going to completely eradicate poverty. That's impossible. And the reason why it's impossible is because scarcity is part and parcel of economic reality. They actually think that they can have a post-scarcity world. Scarcity means that people's expectations far exceed what's actually available to them. And in economic reality, resources are finite. They're not infinite. That's why why there's scarcity. It's just like the example I gave in the economic calculation problem and I showed and I illustrated from Thomas Sowell's example of beachfront housing. Well there's only one beachfront, right? There's only so much quantity of beachfront houses you can build there. And there's only so many people that could live in them, you know, so how the hell do you get to decide who gets to live in them? if you don't have the information of prices. And even to make things more complicated with regards to housing, and I've pointed this out before, not everybody wants to live in the same type of housing. And not everybody wants to live in the same type of location. Some people prefer the countryside and other people, you know, prefer living in the city. And then you could narrow things down and say particular people, for whatever reason being, prefer to live in a particular part of the city. These people have an overly simplistic world view of everything and they don't acknowledge scarcity. And this is the reason why economics is a study of trade-offs because there are consequences for your actions. If you waste valuable scarce resources misallocating it into producing something that the market is not in demand of, and this is classic of socialism because it's faced with the economic calculation problem, creating the consequence where a great many others are left without. He's talking about ending poverty. You know, I don't think you will ever see you know, getting rid of a hundred percent. You're always going to have rich and poor people, in other words, that's just economic reality. And by Christ, how the hell are you going to solve that problem with A, a moneyless based economy, or B, trying to fix prices above or below market value and running the printing press. You're just not going to. Anybody who thinks socialism is going to end poverty or just living in cloud cuckoo land. As someone who supports capitalism, I'm not painting you a worldview of perfection. It doesn't exist. The free stuff is not more affordable folk. And it all goes down to the whole broken window fallacy thing again. They, they really don't understand. And the reason why they don't understand it is because socialists really only see things from face value. They don't understand that their so-called free stuff a great deal more expensive. You don't see it for face value, but in the background, you're cutting back and compensating elsewhere in the economy to make way to pay 
for those things because after all what do you think pays for all the machinery what do you think pays for the x-ray machines what do you think pays for the wages of the doctors and nurses they don't work for free what do you think pays for the operation of the hospitals etc all of that comes at a cost it actually comes at a greater cost they just don't see that they just think oh well free at the point of use and that's where the the argument ends for them take for example great britain with the nhs or scotland with the free prescriptions the free tuition fees for a university etc etc they completely ignore scarcity they don't understand the laws of supply and demand and they don't understand that healthcare and education is not an exception to the laws of supply and demand therefore healthcare is not inelastic when you remove the price and make it so-called free at the point of use consumer demand is going to drive go way out of control well what do you think happens would well, of course the likes of nicola sturgeon open up education such as the you know free tuition fees for university for the rest of europe that's what she did and of course the, you get the free tuition fees for you know scotland as well in general that comes at a very heavy cost because the demand is going to soar it's going to be a far far greater demand you can't ignore the laws of supply and demand and this is essentially what robert reich is trying to do you know he thinks it's just a case that you can just remove a price and be faced with no consequences for your actions well if that's the case why is the nhs ever since its inception been faced with rationing problems every single decade being faced with the price shortage problems such as the medical staff shortages hospital bed shortages you know the surplus waste problems etc etc they try to use this argument because they say oh well look at american healthcare costs well america's got two healthcare systems believe it or not one's not well known about it's the direct primary care and again you can go and check out my video on that but i think it's important that you check out my video on american healthcare costs why it costs so much and then you'll get to understand because then you'll see why their argument is deeply flawed. The universal healthcare systems and the likes of these Scandinavian countries, for example, are being propped up by the United States taxpayer. That's, that's who's paying for it all. I love how he touches upon this to do with the infrastructure. As if they say, oh, if it wasn't for government, we wouldn't have any infrastructure. You know, it's just like the argument they said about, you know, roads. Oh, if it wasn't for government, we wouldn't have any roads. That's rather quite interesting because in the United States of America, there was no income tax until about 1913. And of course, the only other way that they could, you know, pay for these things would be through the internal improvements, which is basically corporate subsidies. But as I pointed out before, and I said I would get around to doing something separate on the corporate subsidies, etc. Well, at the end of the day, hundreds of private companies who all took on these government subsidies were all going bankrupt. It was through the market itself, you know, financing itself that built all the roads and the infrastructure, etc. Thanks to all the government intervention that drove all the private sector costs through the roof, you know, argument to try and project the blame off onto capitalism is if to say, we've got all these expensive costs, etc. Oh, it's to blame on capitalism. It's all thanks to the mixed economy and all the socialist government interventionism. So the last two points he touches upon there was in, to do with reversing climate change which is nonsense and of course investing in communities. Climate has been changing ever since the days of the dinosaurs and even way beyond then and the average global temperature on planet earth was far hotter during the period of the Roman Empire than it ever is today. It's just an excuse for them to use to try and take more and more control. More central planning in other words. Oh look they're, they're causing such a disaster. Oh that this means we need to bring in all the controls over the economy. How convenient that just falls in line with socialism. If you really want to put climate alarmists on the spot, ask them how socialism's going to solve the problem. I mean, the economic calculation problem, how the hell are they going to solve the problem? Are they going to solve the problem by fixing prices above or below market value that destroys the information of profits and losses? This then correlates to that last point on investing in communities in relation to the climate change. Well, okay then. So how are you going to finance it? Do you expect people to work for free with no money? Or do you want to run the printing press? How is that going to be sustainable? That's exactly what led Zimbabwe to hyperinflation. It's exactly what led Chile and Venezuela to hyperinflation. It's not even debatable. It's understanding basic economics. The super wealthy have to pay their fair share. So there you have a bit of a concession there. He supports a monetary based system, in other words, paying people wages. And you've got to ask the question, 
Well, how are you going to do that? It's down to running the printing press. Now, when you're devaluing the base of the currency, you're hurting the very poor people he proclaims to protect. Okay, well, if you're going to go down that road, well, you're going to be faced with hyperinflation eventually. If you tax the rich people half to death so that they're no longer rich in that sense, in, in his terminology of rich, you know, tax them of their wealth, where then is the incentive for anyone to become wealthy, to improve. There is no incentive. You may as well remain in poverty because you're basically, you know, working hard for absolutely nothing. You've basically said, well, if you try to become rich, we're just going to tax the arse out of you. What's the point then? What's the point even working hard? There's no point. May as well just sit in your ass and do nothing. <laughs> These socialists just don't understand human nature. And part of that human nature is, like I said with the Berlin Wall, they've got legs to run with and bags to pack. You could look at, for example, the 1950s. The rich people did not pay that 95% tax rate. They just found ways around it. They found loopholes, etc. And that's essentially what they do. This is exactly what we mean by the dictatorial attitude. They really are dictators. As said before, they really are control fakery. If you said to them, well, all the rich people are going to do is just find ways around it. They're going to find loopholes. So what, what's their attitude? Their attitude is, we'll force it out of them. We'll take away the loopholes, etc. We, we'll force it out of them. They, they want to control every aspect of your life. That's essentially what leads socialism down the road of all this dictatorship. Human beings are not you know, chess pieces on a chessboard that you can just control around and, you know, dictate what they have, what they own, etc. Human beings are self-interested. And if you try to control them, they're always going to try and find ways around it. That's just economic reality. It's the very reason why you saw in the Soviet Union a black market. Because when controls put, are, are put in a place, you always find ways around it. That's the very reason why gun control didn't work. You know, criminals don't abide by the law. They just go to places like the black market. You know, they don't abide by law. They don't understand human nature. That's a, lo a long-winded argument, but you're getting the gist of it. First, repeal the Trump tax cuts. People have got a brain to think for themselves. They're not going to do what you tell them. They're just going to pack up and leave and they'll take their businesses with them. And if it's not that, then of course you raise the tax rates. What are they going to do to compensate for that? If they don't leave, they'll pass that off onto the consumer. That's what they do. <laughs> that's, it, that's it. Who's going to suffer the consequences? It's a private company. They'll just raise the prices. So who is it that that suffers as a result of that? The very poor people you proclaim to protect. All they're going to do is just raise the price of their goods and services. After all, what worth is paper currency if you can't buy anything with it? <laughs> it's no secret Trump's giant tax cut was a giant giveaway to the rich. 65% of its benefits go to the richest fifth. 83% to the richest 1% over a decade. In 2018, for the first time on record, the 400 richest Americans paid a lower effective tax rate than the bottom half. Repealing the Trump tax cuts benefits to the wealthy and big corporations will raise an estimated $500 billion. The reason why these giant corporations benefit is because of the strong government regulation that was put in place in the first place. And that's what the big corporations lobbied for. That's how they gained the special interest favours. Why do they think that eliminating the taxation and for some strange reason opening up the free market and bringing in competition somehow means that you're benefiting the corporations. <laughs> it's so arse end backwards, folk. Reducing the tax rates allows businesses to be more productive, even the corporations. It allows them to mass produce. And who do you think benefits as a result of that? Through economies of scale, who benefits? The consumer. Second, raise the tax rate on those at the top. In the 1950s, the highest tax rate on the richest Americans was over 90%. How convenient. I'm just actually going through the video at the moment, and there you have it. He's speaking about the 1950s. Now, like I said, the rich did not pay the taxation of the 95% tax rate. They just found loopholes and found ways around it. And even if you try to force that out of them, they're just going to raise the cost of their goods and services and pass that off onto the consumer. If you tax them at a higher rate, there's less being produced because it costs you to produce. So if you're producing less, 
the cost of goods and services drive up. They could turn to these Scandinavian economies uh, as much as they want. They could look at that of the likes of, you know, Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, etc. But they completely ignore the fact that these countries are faced with a variety of problems. They do have low levels of government regulation, etc. They've got a lack of productivity. The high GDP, like I said, in Norway comes off the back of the energy sector. They're basically abusing the North Sea oil and whatnot and have got a severe lack of productivity in their domestic economy. So the cost of goods and services are through the roof. That's not going to last forever, folk. So the higher tax rates is not going to last forever. Their big extensive welfare state's not going to last forever because natural resources don't last forever. <laughs> they just don't get that. Third, a wealth tax on the super wealthy. Wealth is even more unequal than income. The richest one-tenth of one percent of Americans have almost as much wealth as the bottom 90% put together. Now, this is really interesting because he seems to acknowledge that wealth is in relation to do with their assets and this is what he wants to tax out of them. What you buy and what you own is yours. The very fact that they want to tax that out of people is unbelievable. That's worse than the income taxation. Downright theft. That's basically saying you can't own your own possessions. How dare you even own your own private business? How dare you even own your own assets that you invested in and you worked hard for? Let's just tax it out of you. <laughs> Let's just move on to point four. Fourth, a transactions tax on trades of stock. The richest 1% owns 50% of the stock market. A tiny one-tenth of 1% 1 tax on financial transactions, just $1 per $1,000 traded, would raise $777 billion. Again, folk, human beings are not robots. How does he think the stock market operates? Now, I'm not someone who's into the stock market and I'm not someone that's an investor and stuff like that. So I'm not, you know, entirely clued up with the ins and outs of the stock market. But I've got a basic understanding to understand that the stock market is really no different to anything else in business. It's just like this whole thing to do with the wealth tax. It's theft. Investors are faced with the reality of two things risk and return. And it's just like I spoke about in the financial crisis of 2008 recently. They're going to take a risk for every investment that they, that they make and therefore they'll be cautious over what they invest in. And the second thing is the investment itself. They want to ensure that they're going to make a return. Does he honestly think that, you know, investors are just some sort of robots that just, you know, have a wee zip up the back of them and a wee button to press in the back of them? It's insanity, folk. Next. Fifth, end the stepped-up cost basis loophole. The heirs of the super-rich pay zero capital gains taxes on huge increases in the value of what they inherit because of a loophole called the stepped-up basis. At the time of death, the value of assets is stepped up to their current market value. So a stock that was originally valued at, say, $1 when purchased, but that's worth $1,000 when heirs receive it, escapes $999 of capital gains taxes. Robert Reich doesn't really seem to understand the purpose of the market value. And again, it's this thing, they, they honestly believe that they can just control prices and everything. The market value is there for the sake of the laws of supply and demand, for the sake of scarcity, for the sake of economic reality. You know, at the end of the day, you can't ignore the laws of supply and demand. They think it's just a case that, oh well, you can just remove prices and uh, whatever could go wrong. As if demand just somehow is, is fixed. And you can just fix demand. You can just control it. The Soviet Union and every socialist regime tried all of this and they failed miserably. Wealthy people are not going to stick around to, you know, pay for all of this. And you could try and control them as much as you want and try and stop the loopholes in the name of doing so. It's like that, that whole thing with the cat. It goes for one, it slams it down, and then up pops another one. You know, that that's what these socialists are like. They don't understand that every time they try to control the issue, something else props up. And then they try to control that, and then the other one pops up. <laughs> they just don't get it. Okay, so that's just the gist of his argument, and the rest of the video is more or less just the same. Creditors are the ones who hold the purse strings, right? See, and it's just like that with Scotland, as an example. The creditors in Scotland do not feel 
comfortable with the idea of Scotland separating from the Union. They don't. See if the creditors who hold the purse strings packed up and left the country, the only place that the government would be left with then is running the printing press. What are they going to do to these businesses who refuse to reduce their costs? Are they going to set down price ceilings? and create price shortage problems etc. Businesses are not going to stick around for that. It's theft of what he's arguing, as I said. Especially that wealth tax. I mean, that's what, that is ten times worse than the income tax. That really is folk. That's basically saying, we'll tax you of anything that you basically own. What's the fucking point buying stuff then? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's, what's the fucking point? What's the fucking point, you know, owning stuff? <laughs> There's been no, no point whatsoever. You can tell these... Uh, they, they just live on another planet, folk. Robert Reich lives on another planet. So anyway, folk, if you've got anything you would like to add, comment in the comment section below and I'll be sure to get back to you, but that is just insane. Anyway folk, thank you for watching and I shall talk to you later. Cheers.